Kia ora tato, no mai, haere mai. Greetings to you all and welcome to this EHF live session with fellow Manyak Malik. This topic is about decentralized identity management systems designed for distributed energy resources, often referred to as DER. In this session, Mayak will discuss the algorithmic underpinning key maker and key checker, a set of smart contracts, protocols and helper libraries that enable social verification of their DER identity. Mayak has a software engineering and technology development background with experience in investment banking, wholesale finance, trading algorithm and financial model development, He's currently the Chief Data Officer and Blockchain Lead for Grid Integration Systems and Mobility. A little bit about EHF for the first time as to one of our conversations. Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of over 500 entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now these live sessions are informal conversations between the fellows and the New Zealand ecosystem. So you can get to know them and what they bring to New Zealand and often the start of an ongoing conversation through to action. We'll be having a 45 minute presentation, then moving into Q&A and discussion with you all during this next 60 minutes. Just a reminder that this conversation is recorded and you can either put your question uh, in the chat as we're going, or you can actually put your hand up. Mayak has said he doesn't mind having questions during the presentation. So over to you. Thanks, Michelle, for that introduction. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Or if you're watching this later recorded, thanks for watching. Let me quickly share my screen here. Michelle, do you see the presentation mode or do you see? Perfect. No, it's perfect. perfect. Thank you. Sounds great. So we're going to talk about Secure ID. Um, it's a project that was funded by US Department of Energy. Um, it's a project around decentralized identity management of grid assets. Um, before we get into the details of the project, a little bit about me. Um, I work at Slack National Accelerator Lab. It's one of the 10 Office of Science labs that are owned by the US Department of Energy. Slack particularly is operated by Stanford University. So I have one leg in academia and one leg in research, uh, in high, um, energy research in the US. Uh, Slack is a lot of things um, from pure science. We do a lot of research from pure science, basic sciences uh, to applied sciences. Um, Slack has won a few Nobel prizes over the uh, 60 years. And particularly my work resides in the energy sciences directorate uh, in a group called Grid Integration Systems and Mobility. So our agenda today is we're gonna look at the evolution of the grid, where the grid's headed right now. Uh, we are going to then talk about some background and current state of identity management systems that are being deployed on grid assets. Uh, we look at the pros and cons of the approaches they are taking. We'll then get into the core of the presentation today, uh, which is Secure ID, and discuss the algorithmic underpinnings of what makes it uh, work. And finally, we'll look at some of the applications of the technology we've developed and uh, what future improvements can be made. One of the things before I get into the slides, uh, a lot of what I'm about to share has a very US centric or California centric view maybe. The trends generally apply to all over the world, but the numbers that I'm going to be showing here are very specific to California. Uh, so let's talk about the first thing, evolution of the electricity grid. Um, we are seeing an onslaught of DERs and we are seeing deep electrification of transportation. What does that look like? To see where the grid is headed, we first need to look at how the grid was designed in the past. And in the past, the grid was designed in this layered topology where all of the generation was happening in a generation layer. So you see all your power plants, coal power plants, nuclear power plants, hydroelectric stations, and once the energy was generated, it was then transmitted through the transmission network, which is the second layer, and finally delivered to the distribution network from where it reached the consumers. So when you and I you know, switch on a light bulb and get the electrons delivered to us, those electrons were generated in the generation section, transmitted through the transmission network into the distribution network to our homes. And that worked really well. The grid was designed with centralized production uh, it was designed for reliable transfer of power in one direction from generation to transmission to distribution to, to us. 
And it worked really well with predictable loads and it serves its purpose. So anytime you, you know, hit the switch on, you get the electrons delivered to you. But the grid is changing and the two big things that are happening right now are, one, there is growth of distributed generation. So distributed generation or DERs, distributed energy resources are things like photovoltaics, uh, PV panels, you see rooftop PV panels here. And there's a huge growth in solar. And in of itself, it's not a problem because it's you know, accelerating our transition to clean energy. But when you start generating at a distribution grid, you are now having bi-directional flow of electrons. So electrons that are being generated at the generation level and flow down, uh, which is how the grid was designed. And now you're getting some generation at the end and there's imbalances that that causes to the you know, power system. Uh, just to take a look at how much uh, growth are we seeing in DERs, uh, this is a graph for U US. You can kind of see this is, by the way, this is only showing renewable energy sources. Uh, so you see the hydropower is somewhat linear. Um, there is some growth in some years, but it kind of, in some decades, but it kind of continues along a linear path. But when you look at solar and wind, we are seeing a hockey stick curve. There's a huge, immense growth in the deployed solar and deployed wind um, on the distribution network. Um, and as these assets are coming online, they need to be integrated with the grid. And one of the challenges it creates from a cybersecurity standpoint is these assets come up with their own sets of protocols. They come up with their own sets of uh, communication mechanisms. They have their own hardware. And now we have to integrate at every level data software as well as hardware with the rest of the grid network. And that increases the threat surface area for cyber attacks on this network. Here's another chart that shows the increase in the installed solar capacity across the world. And you can kind of see it's, it's a global trend right now uh, where more and more rooftop photovoltaics is being installed. And therefore being, we are seeing an increased um, you know, dirt surface attack area coming up uh, as we integrate these assets with the grid. The second big trend that I wanna talk about is electrification of transportation. And the, the number that I used is this. If you have a Tesla, you know, um, Model S 85 kilowatt, and let's say you're charging it four times a month, that effectively is enough energy of a 60% of a home in California. And that effectively means now you have a 60% of a home in California moving around on the roads, plugging in wherever it wants to, and putting that load on the different parts of the grid. And that creates an interesting problem for the grid operators and planners they need to know where to deliver these electrons. So they need to have this um, infrastructure in place to be able to deliver those electrons to you. And if you have 60% of a house moving around, putting, it low, putting its load wherever it wants to, you need to have that information up front and have that entire network of charging stations integrated into the grid assets. And when you have these charging stations, they again come up with their own sets of protocols that they use for communication. They come up with their own hardware, they come up with their own software. And as you integrate these three layers with grid assets, that again expands or widens the threat surface area for cyber attacks on the grid. So that's kind of the underlying, you know, sort of premise upon which the need upon which we are starting to see why new security mechanisms, particularly identity management systems, are needed as, as we are making our transition from largely fossil-based electricity to uh, renewable electricity grid. So background and current state, the first thing to the first thing to maybe talk about is the reason we want to integrate these devices is because the data that they bring to the table is incredibly useful for us to plan and operate the grid, which means we must be able to do two things. We must be able to trust the device. So we must be able to trust the device and say it is who it claims to be. And we must be able to trust the data that's coming out of that device. So we have to be able to do both. And currently the way we do that, the way a device proves itself and proves the integrity of its data stream to other devices on the network is we either use secure non-volatile memory plus hardware cryptographic operations. We have this relatively newer technology called physically unclonable functions also called PUFs. And we have a very special case of PUFs called physically obfuscated keys, box, and I'm gonna discuss each of these in brief detail before getting into the work we have done in Secure ID. But 
The current best practice is using a non-volatile memory. So this is the hardware component with hardware cryptography. And these are commonly, you know, you've seen these commonly as TPM chips. So if you work in a big corporation with a laptop being given to you by the company, you typically get a card that you put in the a card or a USB stick that you put in the laptop to allow it to authenticate itself to the rest of the network, thereby giving um, some assurances to the rest of the network that the device can be trusted and the data coming from the device can be trusted. And this is the current you know, top line solution that is being used all over the world for devices that are mobile, that move around a lot. And effectively what this approach does is it takes a secret or identity information in this case, and it puts it in a non-volatile electrically erasable uh, programmable read-only memory, EEPROM, or it can have another hardware component called static random access memory, SRAM, uh, but SRAM has, has to always be powered on. So you have to have these hardware components on the device or on the agent that represents the device and be able to store the identity information in there. So it's protected. On top of storing the identity in that hardware, you then have hardware cryptographic operations such as digital signatures or encryption. And you have you know, a fair amount of guarantees around that the key is now secure. And therefore, when a device does present its identity, there is high likelihood that it is the right device that, you know, that you're talking to. So what is the limitation? What is the problem with this approach? Well, one, it's an expensive approach because it's a hardware-based approach. So it's expensive both in terms of the design area of the hardware component itself, and it's expensive in terms of the power consumption, particularly for SRAM-based solutions because they need to come, up, come, up, come with a um, power mechanism, a battery that's always attached. Um, we are also using digital signatures that require expensive cryptographic hardware to implement the SHA algorithm. And even with all of the protections that are around these devices, one of the things you see is that they are vulnerable to invasive attack mechanisms. Meaning if you have physical access to the device, you are now you know, able to tamper it. Then if you can tamper that device, you compromise its integrity. So we have built more hardware on top of the hardware we already place, which is called active tamper detection or preemption circuitry, thereby making the hardware itself even more expensive than it needs to be. So we have a really expensive hardware solution, state of the art, works really well for the most part, but it's expensive. And as we are bringing more and more devices, particularly more and more dumber devices towards the edge of the network to integrate with the rest of the network, um, we can't afford the type of cost that comes with you know, having these hardware resolutions on each of those devices. Um, so that's EEPROM based methods. The new and emerging, and I say new and emerging in air quotes here because the technology is you know, almost more than a decade old, but it's still you know, fairly new in terms of its deployment. Uh, are called PUFFs, physically unclonable functions. And PUFFs are based on the idea that the mask and the manufacturing process, even though it's same for the devices or the ICs that are being produced, there is enough variability that each IC is a little bit different than the rest of the ICs that are produced on the same manufacturing line. And PUFFs leverage this variability to derive the secret information or to derive the identity of the device itself. And therefore PUFFs are generally called as silicon biometric. Now, typically when we model a puff in an equation, it, the equation looks like R equals FC, where C is the challenge. So we send a challenge as an input to the puff. The puff function itself responds with a uh, response R, and that R is unique for every IC that is ever produced. And that's the fundamental idea. So you each device, because of the variability in the manufacturing process is carrying with it, its own identity. So nothing else needs to be stored. There's no separate keys that need to be created. The device can identify itself simply if we model the device as a function R equals FC. And there's lots of advantages to this. You know, one of, one of the things is Puff hardware uses very simple digital circuits. So it's super cheap to fabricate. We don't really have to spend the kind of uh, engineering time and dollars that we do on uh, non-volatile EE from based solutions. Puff applications do not require the use of digital signatures or expensive cryptography. And since the identity itself is derived from the IC characteristics that are on the chip already, no, nothing new needs to be done. Nothing, no new hardware needs to be added to the device itself. And any physical attack to the device 
you know, is meaningless because the moment you power off the device, there is no key anywhere to be had. But puffs are also not without their disadvantages. And one of the biggest ones that we are seeing, which is why this technology is not widely deployed, is that they are prone to degradation based on environmental conditions. Um, so if you take a device and operate it at, uh, in a low pressure environment at high altitudes, then it's R equals FC response may be different enough where we now no longer re recognize the device to be what it claims to be. And things like that are prevalent. There's many, many different types of puffs and each of those puffs are um, prone to different types of degradations to different types of environmental conditions. Uh, the second thing is they are challenging to implement in untrusted networks. And the, the reason this is important for us as we are talking about DER integration into the grid is most of the time DERs, you know, whether it's home batteries, solar panels, et cetera, they're owned by the customer. So the grid operator does not own these devices and therefore does not have any kind of um, control they can exercise on these devices without explicit permission from their owners. Uh, effectively rendering the, the DERs that are operating to be in untrusted network, not in the trusted grid communication networks. And then the third limitation of PUFs is they are, they are slow. The authentication speeds are inversely proportional to the number of CRPs. These are the challenge response pairs. Um, so if you think about a device that supports 10 challenges and for each of those challenges responds with one unique response, you now have a map of like 10 CRPs. And as you give a challenge to a device, you'll have to go through that map and you'll have to look at the right response and then match up to the response that you got for the device. The bigger the CRP table gets, the longer it takes for a puff-based authentication to occur. So it's even though it's linear for deployments that are 100,000 devices or a million devices on a network, these can these are prohibitive enough, the latency is prohibitive enough that Puff may not be the solution to go with. And to solve this particular problem, we came, we came up with a special type of physically obfuscated key, a uh, special type of Puff called physically obfuscated key. Uh, it's still modeled as R equals FC, but it only accepts a single challenge. So there is no CRP map, there's only always one challenge. And for a given challenge, there's only one response. So you get faster response times and um, that's that. You still have all the other limitations of a puff. So even though POX solved the latency issue and um, improved the adoption in a real world environment, they are still subject to the same limitations we have with puffs. Now to the fun part. So we have all of these technologies, they have their pros and cons and um, some are expensive and work really well. Some are cheaper, but don't work well all the time. Uh, how do we solve the problem of making something work all the time and still have it be cheap? And that's kind of what we have done here with Secure ID. Um, our approach fundamentally was informed by this idea that we want to develop a software-based information theoretic approach that allows for the benefits of um, having a hardware-based approach, but purely using software. So no silicon involved. Can we get to the level of information, can we get the information theor theoretic security to the level where hardware is today and not have the cost associated with a hardware-based solution? And at the core of Secure ID is KeyMaker. So KeyMaker is a set of smart contracts, protocols, and library functions. I, I'll, I'll give a brief overview here, but I'll explain this in you know, quite a bit of detail on how this works. But effectively what we try, what we do with KeyMaker is we create a key, uh, which is the device identity. And we then shard that identity into multiple different smaller pieces. We then distribute these shards to the rest of the network, to adjacent devices, to other nodes on the network. And when we need to do verification or authentication of that given device, we simply collect these shards back and we match the shards to what the key would have been. And it's not quite accurate, but I'll explain you know, how that matching works. But effectively we call it a social verification. So because there's a few devices in the network and they are holding shards for the device in question, these devices on the network are in a position to socially verify that the device that's talking to them can be trusted. It is what it claims to be and we can trust the data coming from that device. Underneath Secure ID, there are two algorithms. Uh, one is called Shamir Secret Sharing. Uh, it's an algorithm that was developed by Adi Shamir in, I want to say, 1970s. So it's a really old technique. 
And uh, for those of you who don't work in cybersecurity, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, Adi Shamir is the S of RSA. So RSA is, you know, a very popular algorithm and Shamir is the S of RSA. So he's done incredible work and has a lot of work, particularly in information theoretic security. So we, we are using his algorithm and then we are combining it with symmetric encryption to produce the secure ID keymaker um, protocol. Before we get into how the protocol works, I wanna talk about some definitions and some words that I tend to use interchangeably during, during the discussion. Um, so I'll use the words secret or secret key or private key or the device key to explain the device identifier. And I use them interchangeably depending on the context, but it all means the same thing. When we are talking about DER integration to the grid, each of the DERs have an identity and that identity is a secret uh, or a private key or a device key. Um, and anytime I use these words, I'm referring to the identifier of the device that is known only to that device. The second thing is secret owner. Uh, secret owner is the device of whose identity we are talking about. Uh, we talked about taking the device identity and splitting them into shards. So shard is a single encrypted share of the key or of that secret. And shard custodian or a shard holder is a peer device that has access to that shard that has you know, that has received the shard from the originating device. And finally, custodian is a device that holds a complete set of keys for itself or for its peers. So with those definitions, let's talk about sharding for a little bit. And we'll simply talk about, we'll talk about simple sharding, not computational sharding in this case. So let's imagine that we have a device key that's one, two, three, four, five, six. And let's now split the key into three different shards. So we'll say n equals three, so n is the number of shards. And we'll call each of these shards S1, S2, and S3. So in our case, S1 is 12, S2 is 34, and S3 is 56. And when you combine all the three shards, you can reproduce the key. And it's pretty evident, if you are to perform any kind of validation or verification or authentication in this scenario, in this simple sharding technique, you'll need all the shards we'll need to put all the shards together to be able to perform that verification. So what happens, I'm gonna go back a moment. What happens if one of the shard holders now is unavailable or is switched off or is undergoing some type of maintenance or cannot be trusted? If any of the shard holders are unavailable, you cannot perform verification. So we can solve that by improving our sharding scheme a little bit more here. And we still have the same device key. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. We still have the same number of shards. So we have three shards in this case, but we introduce a new variable called K. And in our case, K equals two, but what that reflects is I don't want all the shards that I have distributed to be available for me to perform the verification. Just two out of the three should be sufficient. So how do I shard in a manner that two shards are sufficient even though I've distributed three shards? And in this case, I create three, three shards, one, two, three, four, let's say blank, blank. The second shard is blank, blank, three, four, five, six. And the third shard is one, two, blank, blank, five, six. And now I only know, need to know two shards. So one of the devices, even if it's unavailable, um, I, I, you know, I can still uh, do verification with two shards. And I have a little bit of typo here, so please ignore this. The shards are represented here in the key, under, under the key right here. So the question is, what is the problem with this? scheme. Like I have now, you know, solved my previous problem of some devices being unavailable and still be able to perform verification. The problem with this scheme is it violates perfect secrecy. And perfect secrecy is the idea that regardless of the size of the shard that I hold, I should not have any more information about the key. And in this case, obviously, you know, since I have more bits about the, the key itself, I can now brute force just guess the key. And it only takes about a hundred attempts to figure out what the right key is. And in this case, it would take a lot more, two orders of magnitude more attempts. So because I've changed the size of the shard, now I have more information about the key and that violates perfect secrecy because perfect secrecy, secrecy says, no matter what the size of the shard is, I should never have more information about the key itself. Meaning I still need the same amount of computational power required to guess the key as I would if the shard were to be smaller. So we had to come up with some constraints around 
what our identity verification protocol must be able to satisfy for it to work well and still have the same degree of um, protection that a hardware-based solution would have. And this is, this is the core of KeyMaker now. So the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the K shards and we want to say that only K shards are required to perform social verification of the key itself. K is always less than N and N is the total number of shards that we have distributed to the custodians. The second constraint is any shard SX must not be a subset of the key. And the third constraint is all shards S1 through SN when combined together must not reveal the key. So this is like really counterintuitive, right? You have N shards that you distributed. You only need less than N shards to be able to perform verification. None of the shards is a subset of the key and all shards combined together still do not reveal the key. And it's really you know, contradicting requirements, but let's apply these to a simple sharding uh, example we talked about earlier and see how they satisfy, those, uh, satisfy the simple sharding technique. So our first constraint, only K shards are required to perform social verification of the key, K is less than N. Of course, in our case here, the key is one, two, three, four, five, six. We have three shards, one, two, three, four, and five, six, and we require all the shards to be able to perform the verification. So we have failed that constraint. The second constraint is any shard SX must not be a subset of the key. Of course, each of the shards here are a subset of the keys, so that doesn't work either. And finally, all shards S1 and S2 all the way to SN, when combined together, must not reveal the key. So when we combine this, we do get the key, and therefore we have failed the constraint. So how do we produce shards in a way that not all shards are required to, to verify the key? No shard is a component of the key itself, and all shards together cannot produce the key. And here's the algorithm. So we'll you know, talk about the algorithm through two, two different examples here. This is the linear example, uh, but we take the key. So here's our key, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we place the key on the y-intercept. Then we generate a random point in space, this one right here. Because we have two points now, we have a unique line with a slope and we draw that line up. And then on this line, there are infinite points and we take any of the n points and make them shards. So what we distribute to the rest of the network are these points. So let's say we distribute three of these points to the rest of the network. Now, when we do verification, all we need is any two of the shards that have been distributed produce the unique line that they fit, that they sit on, and then match that line against the random point and the key that is being held by the device in question. And if those two lines match, if the slope of those two lines match, we know that this device has the key without ever revealing it. And if you look at whether this satisfies all our constraints, well, we have three shards and we need only two to do the verification. So it satisfies constraints number one. The, the second is uh, none of the shards are a uh, subset of the key itself. Yeah, these are independent points in um, duty space. So they are not related to the key in any manner. And finally, if you get all the shards together, just the shards, you only produce the line, but you never know what the secret is because that line has infinite points and nobody, no, none, none of the peer devices are aware that the device key resides on the y-intercept. So we've satisfied all the constraints, but what if, you know, so this is, this is a, what we call a two, three solution, meaning three points distributed with only two shards required. What does it look like when we go to the next polynomial? So we have a parabolic curve here uh, and we are going to do a three end scheme, meaning we have infinite shards that we distribute, but three shards are required instead of two. So we do the same thing. We put the key on y-intercept. We generate two random points in this case. And then we generate the shards on the parabolic curve that we have created here out of these three points. We distribute these shards. And now out of the end shards that we have distributed, we require three to be able to produce this curve. We take the two random points in the key, we produce the same curve. And if the curves fit each other, then we know that the device in question has verified its identity. And we can keep increasing the polynomial up. So we can go to an S curve or a cubic curve and we'll require four points or four shards from the network. And when K is large enough there, you know, it becomes incredibly challenging, especially in a peer to peer um, 
network, like a blockchain network, to be able to compromise the device key. But we didn't stop there. So what we wanted to be able to do was, in addition to hiding the key and creating a zero knowledge proof, as with Shamir secret sharing, we also wanted to be able to recover the key if the device in question was lost. So instead of applying Shamir secret sharing to the identity key, we created another random key, not the random key that we created here. So not these random keys, yet another random key. And we pass that random key through Shamir secret sharing to produce the shards. We then take the actual key and pass it through a symmetric encryption algorithm to produce a cipher. We take the cipher and concatenate it with each of the shards. And then we distribute this, each of these to the peer devices. And the advantage of this is now in the shards, there is absolutely no information, including derivative information about the key because the key was not used to produce the shards at all. And yet if the key was lost due to any activity happening on the device in question, we have recoverability for the key for a system operator to go in and be able to extract or go from the cipher, apply the random key and be able to produce the identity again. In terms of its actual implementation, uh, so algorithmic implementation is generate a random key. We split the random key into n plus one shards using SSS. We then encrypt the identity key using the random key as the encryption key for symmetric encryption. I know it's a lot, but we basically use a library called NACL or the you know, salting secret box library, which consists of an X salsa 20 stream cipher and a poly 1305 message authentication code. We use that to encrypt the identity of the device to be able to then produce the ciphers. We append the ciphers to the shards being produced by SSS. So the output of two and the output of three get combined together and then we distribute the shards, the rest of the network nodes using a gossip based protocol. So that's it. I'm going to pause here to see if there's any questions. If not, we can quickly go into the applications and future improvements. Uh, I see. Oh, that was just Cheryl saying that she was leaving at this point. Okay. She has another commitment already. Um, no, that's actually fascinating. It was really good uh, to see the difference um uh, the problems that you're solving and how you outline those original problems about the environment first um i quite like that that was really interesting um i think at the end of it it would be great then to see how we can help you in new zealand what there is that we can help get this through into new zealand what's needed there so i think unless there's any questions from the floor from ty we will continue otherwise yeah okay sounds good so let's talk about uh applications and future, improve, uh, future improvements to the algorithms. So the applications are many, and I've listed a few broad stroke sort of use case categories, if you will, for this algorithm to be applied. Um, anywhere where we need identity verification and have the need to preserve the privacy of the participant, the algorithm is a really good fit for that. And DERS obviously fit that scenario because at least in California, there's a California privacy laws are incredibly strict, just like they are in Europe with GDPR. And when grid operators need to integrate with behind the meter DERs that are owned by the consumer, not by the grid operator, they need to do so while satisfying some of the constraints around privacy of the own, you know, consumer that owns those devices. So we want to have the algorithm be privacy preserving as well as be able to provide a zero knowledge proof around its identity. So we trust the device and trust the data coming from it. So grid asset communication security is huge. We are increasingly seeing uh, autonomy in transportation. So, uh, and also in DR. So anywhere you have a command control scenarios with grid to behind the meter device integration, we need to be able to trust the device and protect the privacy of the consumer. That's, uh, that's a great use case. And finally, in transportation, we are seeing autonomous vehicles uh, coming up. And in fact, there are, you know, even on Slack campus, we have autonomous, you know, buses and cars being tested all the time. And these devices typically carry a partial neural network with them that they use to process their surroundings and be able to make decisions in near real time about, you know, driving decisions in near real time about, uh, you know, based on the environment that they're in. The thing that we are increasingly seeing 
the need for is these cars who are driving themselves on the road will need to share the results of their neural networks with other, other cars that are around them. And the challenge with that is the cars are not necessarily produced by the same vendor, same manufacturer. So how do we create an interoperable, interoperable trusted layer where a Tesla can communicate with a Toyota and be able to inform? So let's say there's a, there's a Tesla in the front and the Toyota in the back going in the same lane on the road. And for whatever reason, the Tesla sees an obstacle and decides to hit the brakes. Can we now transmit that decision to the Toyota behind so it can now anticipate that the Tesla is going to be braking and therefore can start slowing down, increasing, uh, slow, uh, reducing its response time. And th there's, there's a couple of things that can go wrong, but the two things that are pertinent to our discussion is, one, we have to be able to trust that the Tesla is who it claims to be. So there's no injection, there's no data injection happening in that network and that the car must stop. And the second thing we need to be able to trust is the data that is coming from Tesla is actually correct also. So there's no man in the middle attack happening where you know, falsified data is being uh, put into the communication stream. And for all of those scenarios, we have to be able to have a decentralized distributed protocol that can verify the identity of the device and the identity of the communication and the integrity of the communication stream. And we have to be able to do it at low latency levels. So we can't use really expensive systems uh, and we cannot use really um, uh, latent systems, uh, thereby leaving us with one approach, information theoretic approaches, which is what we have. And uh, I, I think you know, applications in low latency, high performance, high privacy preserving uh, use cases is, you know, this is a tremendous fit for that. This algorithm is a tremendous fit for that. I have partners in the US, particularly you know, Hitachi North America, who are in, who, whose research group is interested right now in deploying the algorithm on their devices in their research lab and commercializing if that ends up being a good fit for them. But uh, to answer your question, Michelle, that could be one of, the, uh, one of the things to look at also in New Zealand. Are there device manufacturers or vendors who are interested in uh, you know, this type of mechanism to be able to provide some sort of trust around the devices that they are shipping and you know, what kind of environments are those devices running in? Does the use case fit the, the advantages that this algorithm brings to the table? Um, I, you know, I would love to have some connections there. So this is, a, a, so your timeline on this is actually now, isn't it? You can, you're able actually to do this now and yeah. Yeah, so we have the core algorithm, we have tested it out, we have deployed it in uh, two different test labs, one at Stanford University and one at Slack. And we are in conversations with not only device manufacturers, but also in conversations with US Department of Energy to further the work that we have done so far. And that brings me to my uh, final slide, which is these are the features that we are hoping to add in the next two years to this protocol to make it a full-blown identity management system. And we want to be able to do continuous authorization. So we don't want to authorize the device one time and uh, we just every single time a device is transmitting data, we want to reauthorize the device to make sure that it is accessing the resources that it should be. It should be. Um, Role-based access control. Uh, we are looking to add new roles and policies to different devices. Uh, and finally, risk-based authentication. So if uh, based on the telemetry, and the logs, authentication logs from the device's uh, you know, uh, history of operations, we want to be able to infer if the device is showing some sort of anomalous behavior, if it's logging in from a different geography maybe that it doesn't sit in typically and see if that changes the risk profile of the device authentication for it to happen or not and change the authentication mechanism. So maybe be able to add a second factor if need to. Uh, so we are looking into you know making that happen. Uh, we have some ideas around how we are going to do that, but um, that's still work that is not you know um, published. So I'm going to withhold those details, um, and I will pause here for any kind of questions anybody has. That was amazing. Thank you. You could even um, um, if you unshare your screen now, actually. Sure. That's fantastic. Good. And thank you for sharing. It was you've put it in such a 
a fantastic way for to learn and and quite um, easily understandable for, for even a person that's not in security or blockchain to be able to understand. You have a fabulous way of of uh, presenting it. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any Thank questions? You.